Today we are making fish head soup with Melanie Brown. Melanie, thanks so much for being with us today. Melanie is an active community member with Slow Fish. She's currently in Juneau, Alaska, would normally be in Bristol Bay at this time. So thank you for joining us from Alaska. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Melanie, to tell everyone a little bit more about you and what you do and your family and the fisher, the sort of legacy of fishing in your family and in Alaska. Thanks again for being with us today. Guyana Giselle, in, in my great grandmother's language, um, that's, that's how you say thank you. My great grandmother, Anna Shikan, she spoke Yupik. She was born in a village um, called Livlak at the mouth of the, the Quijak River. And, and then when she uh, was sent for to marry my great grandpa, Paul Shukan, um, she went to marry him in Naknik. And that's where my mother was born. She was raised by her grandparents. And uh, my mother started fishing with my great grandpa, Paul Shukan, when she was 10 years old. And then when I was 10 years old, I started fishing and my great grandpa was still fishing. Um, at that time, I was lucky enough to know my great grandparents well into my 20s. Uh, they were both survivors of the um, Spanish influenza pandemic uh, that decimated the adult population in uh, Bristol Bay. But when they picked up the pieces, they both they both became fishermen. First, my great grandfather, he he was issued a company boat uh, during the sailboat era of Bristol Bay that lasted until the 1950s, even though the technology existed uh, so that, you know, fishermen could have fished in power boats, but by regulation, only um, double ender sailboats were um, allowed for drift fishing. Um, and my great grandfather eventually transitioned to uh, set netting and he staked out a site in the mouth of the Naknik River uh, that I continue to fish to this day with my children who represent the fifth generation of fishermen in our family. Um, when, when I was younger um, and my great grandparents were still alive, it was, it was really wonderful. My, um, my great grandmother, she would um, have soup waiting for us um, oftentimes when we would come home from the beach. Um, it was especially welcome on really, really stormy, you know, rainy and windy days, you know, when we were getting pummeled by waves um, and uh, just to come and taste taste her good soup was was really special. Um, I, I also I want to mention that um, right now I am standing on Tlingit Ani. That means I am standing on the ground of the Tlingit people. Um, the Akwan and the Takukwan people are the people of this land. Um, it was the Taku River that um, that uh, I believe caused uh, the, the Tlingit people to people this place uh, because of the salmon that, that it provides. But my people were uh, nourished by, have always been nourished by the um, Naknik River in Bristol Bay. Um, and today um, I am going to be um, cooking this head it is the head of a Chinook salmon um, from the Chitna River, which is a tributary to uh, the Copper River. My, um, my brother-in-law was kind enough to send me a whole king salmon um, a couple of weeks ago with some heads. I told him I was going to be doing this webinar, and so he sent me some king heads from the other kings that he caught. And yeah, so this is um, a Chinook head from the Chitna which is a tributary of the Copper River. And I'm sure that many of you, um, you know, if you're fish enthusiasts, you've heard of the famed Copper River Kings. Um, so this is very special. There's still some meat left behind the head. Um, you wanna make sure that there's no sign of gills um, left in, in your head. I have a little bit right here um, it's hard to get all the gills out until you really get into cutting the head apart sometimes. But um, so I'm going to cut those out. It, it, they're like, if you leave those behind, they taint your soup. And they're, they're sort of like bloody feathers almost. You, very, you know, I don't know of any good way to eat gills. So that's one part of the fish that isn't fully utilized. But that's the beauty of cooking the heads is you're like, in my opinion, you're honoring the fish 
when um, when you use every part of it and um, if you have the backbone of the fish that's another um, element of the the frame that would add um, more flavor to your soup but uh, the head is where all of the omega most of the omega-3s um, reside I know it seems kind of counterintuitive because the the flesh of salmon is just so rich looking um, in color but the the real oil is in the head and um, so that's it yeah and it's and I also love the fact that like I identify with this food so much as a native food to me it's it's native food um, but there's there's so much rich culinary tradition around the heads um, you know especially when it comes to you know like making consomme um, in in the French style of high cuisine but um, when when you have that soup it's you know it's like it's processed enough that you don't get to enjoy like the parts of the head and I, I hope that um, you will be adventurous enough to um, to try these parts along with me I, I'm going to teach you how to find the cartilage how to uh, separate it from the the bones in the head and um, it's actually quite good to eat but there are some other parts to the eye a lot of people like the eye. I don't particularly like the eye myself. To me, it tastes very metallic and the texture of it. Uh, once it's cooked, it's it's got kind of a fatty texture, but then other people that's like their favorite part of the head. But there are some really great muscles behind the eye that are very pleasant to eat. So I'll be able to show you that I'm going to try to get in close without dripping on my keyboard. Um, so I can show you these things. Um, the cheek is amazing it's like it's right here um it it rests behind the eye you can you can even if you actually have a head you can kind of feel it under the plate of the cheek um this particular head um my brother-in-law was nice enough to leave some collar pieces this is like the probably the richest meat um and it rests, you know, right, like right underneath the um, the gill plate. Um, and it's just, it's wonderful, amazing meat to eat. Um, and I think I'm actually going to bake it later. Um, but these are, these are pieces not to discard. Um, and to me, they're, they're real treasures. But before I start cutting the head, let's get our, our soup started and then I can start cutting while the soup is getting hot. Um, I just want to look at my notes and make sure that uh, there isn't something I really wanted to share that I, I uh, forgot about. I, I'm ready to move on. I just need to rinse my hands real quick. So I'm going to start by uh, turning, I'm just going to use a modest sized stew pot uh, because I'm just going to be cooking one head and I'm going to turn my pan just past medium heat for starters just, and then just put a glug of olive oil in the bottom of the pan and I, here I have a heart of celery. And I'm going to make about seven really thin cuts um, off the end. Just into little crescents. So um, normally when I'm commercial fishing, um, the fish that we target are sockeye salmon, red salmon, and a red salmon would make perfectly good head soup as well. But of course, because it's a smaller fish, you would need more heads. Um, I, right now I'm just cutting some onion. I'd say like um, a real small yellow or white onion is, is a good amount to use. Or if you have a bigger onion, um, a half half of a big 
white or yellow onion is good. I forgot to tilt this down. I'm sorry, I'm gonna tilt it down so you can see a little better what I'm doing. Um, yeah, I'm just, just cutting some rings of onion. And um, the pan is heating. You wanna just kinda cook, cook your vegetables in the bottom of your pan. Um, there's no point using a saute pan and potentially losing some of the flavor to the pan. Um, plus you just have less, less dishes to wash in the end. <laughs> so yeah, just break up your rings um, of your onion. Let them really, really get hit by the heat and start kind of sweating and um, softening up. Got to grab my wooden spoon. One of my fishing partners made me this beautiful spoon from wood that she had salvaged uh, from an ash tree. Um, she's a friend of mine that has been fishing with our family. She was always my um, my ski ski partner, um, and then she started fishing with um, with our family when we were still in high school. And she she still fishes, although she's not going up this this year because of COVID. But I love cooking with this spoon. Um, and then, uh, I'm going to just add a little bit of seasoning. I really like, my mom really turned me on to using, um, onion powder. Um, it's very complimentary to fish dishes. In, in my opinion, I think gar raw garlic, it's, it's great with meat, but I don't feel that it's a particularly good, um, Sometimes it can overpower fish. Um, at least salmon has a good, it's one of those fish that has its own wonderful flavor and it's not dependent on whatever you top it with. Um, and then a little, you know, pinch of sea salt just to kind of get, get your, the base going in your soup. Um, and then, I like to add a little bit of um, short grain brown rice for texture, and it's a really, really nice rice to use because um, even if it does get over boiled, it doesn't puff up and just take over all of the liquid in your soup. And I, I just use a quarter cup. It's just enough to add texture and body to your soup without like I said, without taking it over. So my veggies are, they're sweating pretty good. I am going to add some, um, some fresh cold water to this pot about to halfway, you know, cause you want to leave enough headroom for the volume that your head is going to take up in the soup. And I'm just gonna let it just keep heating um, as I get ready to um, to cut my head. And I'm kind of wondering if I need to rearrange my positioning here, but I think I might have already uh, gone too far down the road. Actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move to my back burner so that you can see more um, the the cutting area. Um, looks good, Melanie. I think also you could push it. That's perfect. Then we can okay. Right there. Cool. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to move these aside because I don't need them now. Um, and one thing, I'm sorry, I need to adjust the ring on this. There. Um, one thing that it may sound kind of weird, but 
Cardboard is a really great cutting surface, in my opinion, or brown paper bags. They're really great for cutting fish because they keep the slime from, uh, the slime will hit this paper and then it'll kind of like lock the fish down. Um, but it's like, it's firm enough that you don't need to worry about paper particles getting on your head. And it just makes it easier to clean your cutting board too, you know, not like, to get all the slime, slime off. So it creates kind of a shield for your cutting board, but it also just adds security because you have to be really careful when you're cutting the head. Please, please um, take great care. I don't want anybody getting cut today. Um, the heads are not an easy thing to cut through. Um, but um, hopefully I can show you some things that will make it a little bit easier for you. Um, so here's the head. Um, you want to handle it. You want to approach getting ready to cut it by having it upside down. So the, chi the chin or the jaw is up. And I like to make my first cut right, right in this opening. You're, you're gonna wanna make two, um, two mirrored pieces of the head for starters. And another thing I like to do just to add a little more security to, to my, uh, you know, the head not slipping out of my hands is I'll have, I'll have a paper towel um, on my non-cutting hand. Sorry, I need to move the screen down again. And hopefully you'll be able to see what I'm doing. I'll try to come back and forth to the camera so you can see where, where I make the cuts. And um, so if you're using a chef knife, then you're going to want to just poke right down into that spot that I was telling you about. Just cut, poke down as far as you can all until you get all the way down to your, your uh, cardboard. And then uh, turn your knife. And it may, your knife may kind of choose its, its direction from there. It may not be perfectly mirrored, but you're still going to be approaching things the right way. So when it comes to splitting heads, I just I want to talk about the my my great grandma used an uluak. Um, these are also known as ulus. Um, they're they're curved knife. Um, there are you can get commercial ulus in um, like if you visit Alaska. Um, there are a lot of tourist shops that carry them and they'll work perfectly well. But the best ulus are handmade and they're made with repurposed saw blades. And essentially, this acts almost like a mall, you know, like a, a wood cutting mall because of um, how it's designed, um, makes it a lot easier to split the head. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue with this. I hope you won't feel left out that you're not working with an ulu, but um, yeah, that, so uh, I'm gonna continue with, with this tool. Same principle, you want to find the pokey side, poke into the head, go down as far as you can, and then, ugh, like, it takes a lot of force. And um, if you're a little uh, uncertain about your, your strength, then don't, there's no shame in asking for help and turning this into, like, a partnered activity. <laughs> so then... Um, I just turned the head around and I'm coming at it from another angle, poking straight down and then uh, just really kind of bearing down into the, until you get all the way through the head. So, so now I have two, two pieces that are uh, mirrors of each other. And I am going to get rid of the last bit of uh, gill that I have down here. Um, and if you have some nice cooking shears, they, they work really well for cutting the gills out. Um, but you can do it with a knife as well. So now, 
this is what it looks like. This, this cartilage, it looks almost like, um, I don't know, like quartz. And then these are pieces of bone. It's like, it has, it's there, um, the bone, it's, it's, um, it got a lot of capillary action and that's where a lot of the rich oils reside. Um, so I'm going to start breaking this down. I'm going to break it into, um, about five pieces. The, the nice thing about breaking it down is that it makes all of those rich oils cook out of the fish and into your soup more readily. So I'm going to start by taking the, the jaw off of the fish. And um, you want to cut low enough so that you don't cut into the cheek. Um, so if you just cut straight back from the inner, you know, from the innermost part of the jawline, you know, where the, the top of the jaw and the bottom of the jaw meet, that, that would be a good place to cut. Um, and you'll end up with a piece that looks like this. And there's, there is a little bit of meat that you'll find in the jaw. There's a, there's a really interesting rod of cartilage that runs through here that I like to eat. Um, oh shoot, I nicked the cheek. I ended up with a little bit of the cheek in there, but every piece of fish or every piece of the head, even if you don't think you're gonna get some meat out of it to eat, or bits of cartilage, this still all adds to the flavor of your soup. You know, something I didn't talk about is bouillon. Um, I, I'm not gonna be putting bouillon into my soup today just because I, I feel like the head is gonna create enough flavor in the soup. But if, if you are using this as a base for more like a a cubed salmon soup or a cubed fish soup this this will be a really good good base for your soup um you know like for a non-creamy chowder um but if you're not using the head you're going to need some extra help um with bouillon and i i just have like a better than bouillon veggie um veggie bouillon paste for for my base but my mom loves to use chicken herbox and her soup always tastes awesome so there's no shame in not using a highfalutin <laughs> bouillon um so yeah i guess you know it's something you'll have to figure out uh where what your taste preference is but um so next the next part i'm going to cut off it, and again avoiding the eye area because that's a piece that you want to keep intact. Just cut just right in front of the eye and you'll end up with a nose piece. There's a lot of really great cartilage in the nose. I'm going to turn my broth up a little bit so it can really get, get boiling. Um, and then I'll just turn it back down. So here's, here's a nice piece of nose cartilage that's um, ready to go in once the soup comes up to heat. And then the next cut that I like to make is just above the eye. There's a lot of amazing cartilage on the top of the head. I think I, yeah, I showed you the, the inside view of it. Uh oh, I, do, I think I might've just cut my eye. I need to rinse my hands, they're getting too slippery. So there's another piece that you could probably cut in, uh, in half just to have a more, uh, just to portion it down more and open up the capillary action in the head more to release more of the oils. And then the cheek, the precious cheek is housed right in here. It's kind of housed inside this plate. And you can always just leave this, this piece whole um, or you can cut the back back of the cheek off too, the the plate part of the cheek. 
but you're you're less likely to mess up this amazing perfect morsel of cheek if you if you leave that intact so i'm just going to continue on by cutting the other part of this the other half of the head i don't know if there are any questions that um anybody wants to uh talk through while i'm cutting the rest of this head we do have a couple of questions so i will okay. take um one quick question is about how much celery will you put in there or did you put in there um you know i i made like seven really thin cuts i think all in all that comes in like a, just maybe a little more or around a half a cup of celery probably okay perfect yeah and then why cut the fish head into chunks i think instead of, versus putting the whole putting it in whole um i really do believe it well it's it's nice like if you actually do plan on eating the pieces it it creates more um of like well you can kind of ladle through the soup and pick out the the sections that you want um but even if you if you are just doing this for the rich um stock that you can get from the head um uh cut cutting Oh, you know, into the the bones and the cartilage, it re releases more of the head oil into the soup. Right, perfect. Thanks, Melanie. And then yeah. one more question is, how do you handle the rest of the bones? So the spine and the tail and any bone pieces you're not putting in there. So the I actually um, I didn't end up thawing out the backbone, but that is something that I do like to put. Um, put in the soup too because that's another thing that adds more you know more flavor uh to the soup um so if you plan on putting backbone in to add flavor richness i would recommend that you cut it into like say oh my gosh i'm so sorry i'm getting a bunch of text alerts coming through um but uh i'd recommend that you cut your your backbone sections into about um say four vertebra pieces uh -huh. um and then there's there's actually like if you if you break the vertebra vertebra pieces apart there there's even some cartilage in between you know and then there's the spinal cord okay. of course too so like if you really want to get into it you know you can pull those pieces apart and chew on on the inside that's what my dad likes to do Great. um Perfect. but if nothing else you you can get flavor from it and um so I'd, I'd recommend that what, you know, if you do start with the whole fish and you are trying to figure out what to do with all the parts, um, once you, you know, you, you fillet your, um, your salmon off of the frame of the fish, then what you can do is take a spoon and then scrape whatever is stuck to the, the bones. And then you can save that to make salmon patties with or um, stir fries or tacos. Um, so that's another way of not, not wasting the fish, but, um, you know, you can always, if you end up baking your filet or broiling your filet, you can do that with the backbone as well. And then you can just scrape the already cooked mm -hmm. fish off of the backbone. Um, Excellent. so yeah, delicious. <laughs> yeah. And then one last question, um, is. Do you ever rinse the slime off the salmon before cooking it or you purposely? Yes, I do. And I'm sorry, I meant to talk about that, like the for the prep. It's it's definitely important. You want to rinse the excess slime. There will still be some residual slime. I think it's sort of like, you know, salmon's moisture, sort of like, you know, how we always have oils in our. Yeah. So there's still going to be slime on, on the salmon, but you want to make sure that there's no excess blood or um, or uh, slime uh, on whatever you're working with because that will that will really taint the flavor of your soup okay perfect yeah thank you yeah thanks um so i think that this uh it's it's almost ready to to put the pieces in um and then so one thing that i'll say it doesn't take that long for the the fish or for this the um pieces to cook and be edible but um the longer you cook it the more flavor you will render from the head 
And, uh, but any of you who have worked with salmon a lot know how quickly, or any kind of fish, you know how quickly the fish cooks and it's so easy to overcook it and dry it out. And even in soup, it can get overcooked and hard and chalky or rubbery. So if you do have fish pieces that you're wanting to put into your soup, um, you, I would recommend that you wait until your head pieces have been cooking for a while because your, your chunks of meat, they're going to cook almost as soon as they hit that, that hot water. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start putting this here. I'll pull this forward. I'm going to go ahead and start, um, start putting pieces in and let it come back up to a boil. I'm going to save these ones for later. So I don't know if I mentioned that I, I want this, I plan on once this is cooked, I'm going to pull some out so it can cool off enough so that I can um, pull it apart already cooked and um, show you, you know, like show you as closely as I can through the screen um, how to handle the pieces and, and eat them. Um, I need to rinse my hands. So there are some signs of um, how, how well done your, your pieces are. Um, like I, when I show you the inside of the head after I made that first cut, you saw that the cartilage was kind of more, um, I, not clear, but like more of kind of uh, like, um, well, yeah, almost like a, if, if there wasn't the skin behind it, it, it almost looks like you could see light through it. But once, once your um, pieces start cooking more, um, that the color will change of the cartilage and then the eye is another thing that will tell you um, how cooked the soup is um, but it, it definitely needs some time still um, and you also want to make sure that your rice is fully cooked uh, or mostly cooked before you put your head in otherwise you're going to end up eating some some hard pieces of rice um, if there aren't any other questions right now, I am going to um, handle this this tailpiece that um, uh, of um, King um, to uh, you know just cube up and throw into the soup. Um, it's it's just nice to have a pot of soup that like okay maybe everybody it's not their jam to to like eat the head pieces. Um, but at least there'll be some good fish for people who are, aren't just quite ready to, to eat the head. Um, so I, and then, you know, especially if you have children that are, that are in the picture, um, the tail portion of the salmon is a really good, good piece to, uh, to have available for kids because they don't have to worry about little bones in the tail. The, the pin bones are further up in, in the salmon and um, and then there's no belly bones to contend with either. And then I would recommend leaving the skin on and of course, you know, making sure that you've rinsed any of the excess slime off. Um, but the, in my opinion, the skin, it brings flavor to the soup that you don't want to lose by skinning uh, the salmon. And then once it's cooked, the skin slides off really easily. Um, but if you do prefer to uh, to cut the skin off, it's it's quite easy to do. It's like it's much easier than filleting, actually. And I'll I'll just go ahead and um, try to demonstrate that right now. But feel free to throw some questions at me if any have come up, Giselle. Okay, we'll do. Um, yeah, so far, I think we covered them. 
Okay, John, you're asking about the recipe or review. I forgot to mention at the beginning that we will email all of you at the end of this. We'll have links to learn more about Melanie, but also we'll do kind of a simple version of this recipe so you can refer back to it later. So I don't have a recipe to put in the chat right now, but we will email you next in the coming week with that. The more links too about where to find good fish in your area, we, we generally point people to local catch, which I'll throw the URL in here in a second. If you're interested in how to find a whole fish if you're not a fisher. Um, and then we will also send along a recipe and some other tips and links in an email this coming week. And this recording, of course. So we're recording the session. We'll pass it on to you when it's over. Other than that, we don't have any questions at the moment. So with that, thanks for bringing that up in terms of sourcing. That was something I wanted to mention. Um, uh, if you do have a, like a local fish counter that you go to, um, don't be shy about asking. If you suspect that, you know, your fishmonger started with a whole fish and broke it down and put fillets, you know, into the fish counter on ice, um, but the heads aren't showing, there's no reason why you can't ask, hey, um, did, did it come with the head? Uh, and what, you know, oh, if they say yes, then just ask them what they did with it, you know, and don't be shy about asking if they'll save you the head in the future. Um, that's something that my mom, you know, like, as the winter goes on and um, the freezer empties out, <laughs> Um, she, she's gone to our, you know, like one of the local groceries that has a good, um, fish counter and, um, you know, she, she's gotten heads that way. So, okay. So if you want to be able to skin, um, your salmon, this is a technique that I use. That's, it's really easy. What you do is you, you cut straight down into the fish taking care not to cut all the way you don't want to cut through the skin so you cut down to the skin and then all of a sudden you just take a turn i'm right-handed so i'm going to take a right turn and um oh, sorry i need to get closer to the edge i'm going to take a right turn and then just bear down on my knife as as i cut and keep my knife as close to the skin as I possibly can. And then uh, end up with, um, you know, it's, there's still some of that rich skin, you know, the, the fat that's next to the skin. Um, I don't know if you can see that. Um, there's a little bit of flesh that I wasted on the skin, but um, if you really want to fully utilize your fish, you can crisp up the skin in like a, maybe a heavy cast iron pan and, um, you know, with some oil and seasoning and it's, it's quite good fried salmon skin, you know, frying it until it's crispy. Um, I need to turn my, my heat down on my soup and I'm going to pull pull some pieces out so that I can show you, you know, how, how to find all the goodies in the head. So here's the piece that has the cheek and the eye. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab a, a nose piece. Um, yeah, and I'm just going to let it continue to cook on low heat so that more of the, um, you know, more of the oils can render out of the head. And I'm going to put some of these pieces that have more, more of the flat, these are some of the back end of the head, you know, that have the, the salmon um, on them. And I'm going to put some of these pieces in there too. Oh, I meant, to, you know what I meant to do? Darn it. <laughs> One thing that I forgot to, to do and mention is um, I think it's a good idea to see, you know, season the pieces of the head, uh, you know, similar to how you would season any piece of meat before you cook it. Um, at least that's what I do. I know there's different philosophies around salting, 
whether you should do it before or after, but I, I like to do it before, um, before I put it in the, the water. So that way the salt can start kind of acting on the, the, um, meat and dewatering it a little bit and, um, and hopefully locking the flavor in, um, locking that, the saltiness into the fish. But, um, I forgot to do that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but I think it's still going to be good. I know it will be. <laughs> it's, it's hard to go wrong with these, these head pieces. Um, but one thing I will warn you about is, um, you know, you, you have to use your hands to do this. It's going to be sticky. So just accept that. Um, and, um, you know, you may want to have like a, a wet washcloth close by or just, or like a big wad of napkins because <laughs> it's, it's going to be a very physical, visceral experience. So this, the skin on the head, it's very thick and fatty and I don't particularly like to eat it. Um, I would recommend that you try it before you totally dismiss eating it altogether. Um, but you, in any case, you have to peel it off before you can get to the cartilage. And so I just, I just peeled that skin off and, um, here's a piece of cartilage and it's kind of embedded with some bone. Um, I'm going to pull as much off of that off as possible, but this is what it looks like. Um, you can see it's not to totally um, even in its texture. And then there's some capillary action. Um, there, I think there is still a little bit of bone in there, but it's hard to separate it all. But what you do is you just you just put it in your mouth and start chewing. And if you do find bone pieces in there, the then you can just kind of sort them out. And you're gonna want to have like either a bowl or a napkin to set all of your um, your pieces on um, your your discard pieces because you can't swallow everything. But um, so there's a piece of cartilage. It's a little hard, you know. Could have cooked some more, but I for the purposes of being able to show you how to separate the pieces in the head. Um, I wanted to pull it out soon enough for you to be able to, to see that. Um, so now this is, this is like where it gets really kind of intense. The flavors are super intense in this central part of the head where the eye and the cheek is. Um, so, yeah, I'm pulling the skin off. There's some some bone in the cheek plate. Before you just discard that, I would recommend that you take that. You want to chew down on it. Just chew down on it, and then um, that helps to kind of release the juices. And, um, like... Whenever you see these pieces, they, you know, you, you can't chew and swallow them, but they have a lot of flavor that you don't want to miss out on. So, yeah, I'm just going to chew, chew this side too. There's some cartilage mixed in there as well. I hope it's not grossing you out, but this is really the only way that I know how to teach you how to do this. Um, so... Yeah, there's some really, really nice juice in that cheek plate. Um, here, there's some of that nice meat that, um, you know, from where the head meets the back. I'm going to go ahead and eat that now. Mmm, it's so rich. Um, I'm going to peel this skin back. And right here, just, I, I'm... I just want to show you this because I want you to see where the placement of the cheek is. So like the nose would be here, there's the eye, here's the cheek. And this is, to me, this is like so, so amazing. It's the, um, the most wonderful nugget of protein that you can get out of the head. 
it's just incredible the, the most amazing medallion of of protein um um excuse me i have a bone there um so now i'm gonna ch i want to show you the head um excuse me the eye Sorry, you can tell I'm turning. I'm going into like food wonderland sort of space right now, and it's harder for me to concentrate on what I'm saying. <laughs> but uh, so here's the eye, and some of the muscles actually they I think they are sort of rooted to to that cheek that I just showed you, and as you can see, it's like a very it's it's pretty blobby. Um, I mean, no disrespect, salmon, please. Um, but if you, if you decide you want to try the, um, the eye, just be aware that there's a marble in there. So you don't want to bite down too hard when you're, when you're eating the eye, because you could end up hurting your tooth, um, or choking on that marble in the eye. Um, but this is what I really want to show you. These muscles behind the eye, they look almost like clam necks. And um, they're really special. Like you don't want to miss out on eating that. Even if you don't like the eye, these muscles are really, really delicious to eat. Uh, so, so at least give them a shot. You know, if you don't, if, if, if it turns out you don't like them, the, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but, um, but I want to make sure that you know where those goodies are. Um, so right here is where there's a lot more bone and less cartilage, but there's still that really the good flavor that, you know, and again, it's like, okay, just take that, eat it, chew it between your teeth until you get all the good juices out. And then as you're taking it out of your mouth, kind of hold it right here and make sure you get any juices that didn't come out just from chewing it so <laughs> i hope you learned something today it's not like we're born knowing how to eat a fish head so <laughs> i hope you you gained some good knowledge here <laughs> i definitely did i think it's very helpful i've had more than one seafood experience in my life where i was like not in a position to ask for guidance and definitely felt like I was doing it wrong. So <laughs> this is something I imagine doing at home, but it's really helpful. Um, thank you. I, there's a couple of questions in here. Um, Kay is asking if the cheek is white. And so I just want to clarify that that's after you cook it, right? It, it, the color will change to be pretty white or it is a, I was actually, you know, like it always surprises me how like how the flesh will have so much color, but then the cheek is so much paler mm -hmm. and it's that way in, in all species of salmon. You know, it, it's, it's a paler medallion of, mm -hmm. um, of muscle. Excellent. Yeah. It looks really good. So I don't think, I think the only reason that was hard to watch is because now everyone's jealous. <laughs> it's mostly hard to watch out of uh, we want a bite kind of thing I'm getting i wish i could share <laughs> i know it's too bad we can't do a buffet after this these sessions um let's see monica has asked how long is too long to cook or maybe are there cues that you can take for when it's done or you know i'd say um you know if, if you get your broth all the way up to heat and then you um, you put your head in and you bring it back up to heat. Um, it's it it really it. You know if you if you're you're past medium heat, it should be done in like a half an hour. Okay. Uh, I mean that's even long for for the actual time in the the pot if the, if the heat is still on you know and it's continuing to cook but. If you're really trying to make your soup rich, um, as long as you you just have the head pieces in, there's no reason why you can't just keep keep it going. Especially if you don't have bouillon to kind of enhance the flavor. Um, but you d the thing is, like if you intend to cut it or cook it for a long time, just you want to really time well when you're going to put in cubes of 
salmon if that's it, what you plan on doing. Yeah. If it's not just a head soup, you want to like just wait and put the chunks of salmon in um, later. Sure. In the okay. Cooking. And is that when you bring it to heat, is that a low boil, a simmer, or like a, you want a pretty hot rolling boil? I ended up bringing up before I put the, the pieces of head in, I brought it to a boil because I wanted to, a, a good rolling boil because I wanted to make sure that that the rice got cooked. Okay. And um, yeah, and I don't think that it really, it's not like you're like a piece of meat, you know, where you're worrying about searing it if yeah. the heat is too extre or extreme. Um, and I mean, unless you want that, but like it's, yeah, it doesn't hurt it to put, put it into a really well boiling pot. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, that's perfect. John is asking what, what you might do differently, if anything, if you were, if your aim was to make a fish stock. Um, um I'd say there, there probably wouldn't be that much difference. Yeah, it seems like that yeah. the process would be. Okay. Yeah, except you wouldn't use, I, I imagine you wouldn't use bouillon, and, right. you know, because the whole purpose is to render the, as much flavor from the bones as possible. So maybe I might, I might add to, to your point of what to do with the back and the spine and other bones, that if you were just making a stock, like get it all in there for flavor. Is that yes. accurate? Yes. Yeah, so I, I, would I would encourage definitely using the, um, using the backbone. Perfect. If, if your purpose is to make a stock. Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, and then one last question, Kay is wondering if you have other adaptations to the recipe, are there any other veggies you like to add? I, my question might be, does this change seasonally for you? Like if it's, if you have certain things in the spring or the winter or anything like that, are you ever adding other vegetables or ingredients? I, you know, I like to keep, kind of keep it simple mm -hmm. with, with the fish soup because there's just so much flavor that the, yeah that the fish itself has that I think you run the risk of just detracting from that. Uh -huh. But one thing that um, I actually ended up getting um, from our local, um, we have this amazing marketplace called Salt and Soil Marketplace. And uh, I got my hands on some parsnips and, um, you know, I was work working through making sure I was ready for this, you know, like it's mm -hmm. one thing to cook it's a whole other thing to talk about how yeah. you're cooking, you know, and this is the first time I've done this and I, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Uh, but I remember thinking if I were to add another vegetable, I think parsnips would be perfect. Yeah. That's like perfect. more so than carrots. Yeah. Parsnips yeah. are mild and they had to take on the flavor of whatever it goes with. So that sounds great mm -hmm. to me. Excellent. Well, I think a uh, sort of a running theme of all of the cooking demos we've done are trust your instinct and run with your yeah. own flavor preferences. And then I think one thing that I love about this is really the most important thing to me seems that you're starting with a good fish that you're going to get. Yeah. You've got a high quality ingredient to start and then you let that take center stage. Um, so yeah. it's through slow food and slow fish fashion that it's really about those ingredients and you have something that was passed on to you from somebody you know, a source that you know, and so I think that's another theme we've had is start with a good ingredient, good quality ingredient, and let the flavor come from there. Aside from our new, our new skill, and now we know how to make this yeah. too. <laughs> well, you know, Melody, one, go ahead. Oh, one other thing that I wanted to mention, um, and you may know these producers because of where you live, because you live in Oregon. But uh, in my opinion, I think a match made in heaven for that's for. Good wine lovers out there is um a dry riesling or even a semi-sweet riesling um i think go what goes really really well with with the soup there it's very complimentary um okay. and this is a producer a domestic producer out of oregon um in the amity hills and then um pinot gris is another good choice that's readily available domestically and then this is another oregon producer Jason Lett makes um, Irie Vineyards wines. Um, and, you know, depending on what species you're working with, um, you know, if you're working with a king, which is the richest of the salmon species, you might even want to go um, with a, a Pinot Noir. Um, because, you know, even though it's a red wine, it I, I think that um, king salmon is a rich enough fish to stand up to a red wine. Um, and 
um, you know, with the other species, you may may want to take it a little lighter, you know, go with a white wine. Perfect. That sounds perfect. Um, well, thank you. I know this is your first time, but this was wonderful. Very good. <laughs> smooth and understandable and um if those of you out there are making fish head soup let us know how it goes you can tag tag melanie um and slow food on facebook or instagram throw it on the slow food facebook page and just let us see how your soup went or just comment um on the facebook video when you're done and let us know how it tasted melanie thanks so much for your time i really appreciate you and this has been this is really great i love the the nose to tail nature of this meal as well, that we're using every part of the fish. Um, and I also think that I, we, what you said about talking to where you're getting your fish, asking where the heads go, the more I think we talk to our producers and providers, then we can kind of have more things available to us and see a little less waste in that process. Um, so Melanie, you're wonderful. Thank you for being part of Slow Food and Slow Fish. Uh, if you haven't caught the Slow Fish webinars, I'll add a link to that email I mentioned earlier. The really, really wonderful conversations with people like Melanie and her peers in the fishing industry, lots of voices from Alaska and all, the, all around the coasts of the United States. So I encourage you to check that out if you're interested in seafood um, and sort of the people who are doing it, especially at this moment in time, which is different than usual. Um, but thank you again, Melanie, for being here with us and for teaching us this really great meal. And we thank hope to have you back again soon, maybe for some row or something else. <laughs> yeah, I, I would love to come back. <laughs> All right. All right. Everyone out there, have a wonderful Sunday evening. We'll see you again some other time. Melanie, take good care. We'll speak soon. Thank you.